And I want to welcome you back to Torah on the Go. Whether you are working out or walking your dog, uh, we are glad to learn with you today. And uh, I want to welcome you back to in-person Shul Weiss Chapel. We have an audience here. We're, we're uh, recording in front of a live studio audience here at Shul Weiss Chapel. And uh, it's my pleasure to sit here with Rabbi Feinstein. We have the very first question of the, of the day, um, and it comes to us from Howard. Yeah, um, over the last 20 or 30 years, the quality and variety of kosher for Passover foods has improved tremendously. And Rabbi Feinstein mentioned earlier, Passover bagels. Is that necessarily a good thing? Does it blur the distinctiveness of Passover week from the remainder of the year? You want Passover to be more miserable. That's what you're arguing for, Howard? I just want, I want to understand. More holy. More holy, got yeah. it, more holy. That's a better way of putting it, I understand the question. Okay, Rabbi Feinstein. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a stickler. I, I have to tell you. So, and and, and you, I mean, you know me. Uh, the, you know me as as a, as a sort of liberal when it comes to halacha uh, in most most areas of observance, except Pesach. And there's a reason for that. There's a very deeply personal reason. I grew up in a bakery, and Pesach was the only week of the year that my parents closed the shop. The only week of the year I ate breakfast with my father for a whole week. Mm -hmm. um, so Pesach for me was a wonder thing. It was a wonderful holiday. And it was because it was a little bit harder and a lot different and much different than the rest of the year. So every time there is one of these revolutions of let's, let's make it easier. So I, I told you, I went to Cambridge Farms Market. This is not an endorsement, just a, an <laughs> announcement. This is the traditional Jewish market in North Hollywood. And, Boy, you could get anything, kosher le pesa. They had Oreos, you know. Um, kosher le pesa. Fettuccine Alfredo, just to, like our ancestors ate the one that <laughs> came out of the Egypt. Um, we don't need any of that stuff. We don't need any of that stuff. We eat fruits and vegetables, meats and fish, dairy products, uh, matzah, matzah with butter, matzah with chocolate butter, matzah with chocolate and almond butter, you know, pizza, matzah pizza. We, we try to stay away from all of those, those products because for that very reason, I want this week to be different. I want this week to have a tremendous impact on the lives of my family. And in order to do that, you have to overturn the dietary custom of the rest of the year. And that's what we do. All this stuff is kosher. Don't get me wrong. It's kosher, meaning it fulfills the halakha, the deep law. It's kosher if, if fulfilling the letter of the law is what you're after. But I think the spirit of the law means something different. The spirit of the law demands a, a real change, a real change in the way that you live. I remember going to school, I was an elementary school kid, public school kid, trying to bring a matzah sandwich and trying to explain to the kids in my class, because there were two of us who were Jewish, you know, what's a matzah sandwich? Why do you eat, why, what, what are you trying to do that for? It was, that was part of the game. That was part of the wonderland. That was part of the wonderful thing about Pesach. So I, uh, I understand. I agree with the spirit of the question, Howard. Um, keep it, keep it, keep it traditional. How's that? So I'll just add my my uh, my dad's mom, Gammy, whose your site is coming up. Uh, she used to make these wonderful things called bulkalo. Bulkalo, sure. Um, yeah. And uh, and they were what she would say they were Passover rolls. Except I was unaware of any roll. It tasted delicious for exactly four minutes while I came out of the oven. That's right. And then immediately turned into a hardened baseball that you could throw through the window <laughs> easily, more easily than a baseball. Yeah. And, 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 but those bukala, um, they represented something um, more and different. They represented a taste that um, she carried with her from Egypt, uh, from their Egypt. And, um, and it's funny uh, when I see these things, uh, when I see, you know, uh, when I see uh, kosher Passover popovers, which is what I saw the other day in a in, in, in the supermarket. Um, I don't know that we need kosher Passover pop tarts, but for me, it feels like that's reflective of the perhaps the Egypt that 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 we face in a certain way is. You know, our Americanization, our secularization is that anything is possible. We could turn anything into with science. We can make anything kosher for Passover. Um, it doesn't it doesn't matter. And so um, 
Pop-Tarts and all kinds of stuff can be made kosher for Passover. Like Rabbi Feinstein said, the question is, do we want it? Do we want to take this with us? Do we want to accept this? And the Jewish people, I think, in my mind, have a funny way of saying, this might be able to be kosher, but we refuse to accept it. Um, so we won't know till next year if the kosher for Passover bagel will be accepted or the kosher for Passover Pop-Tart will be accepted or, or any of the things that we've seen on the shelves this year. Um, because uh, I agree, like Rabbi Feinstein, there, there's a there's a spirit of Passover that almost is a uh, higher priority than the than the law of Passover. Then, then there was an argument at our table last night about whether you could use wasabi for maror. And that led to another Ooh. argument about we live on the Pacific Rim and maybe it's time to bring Pacific Rim delicacies into Passover. So the question is now sushi. Well, the first question is, if you're Sephardic, you can eat sushi because you eat rice. Sorry, sir. If you're Ashkenazic, you can have sashimi. Sashimi. But then what kind of vinegar is it made out of? And can we get kosher for Pesach sushi? And then, so one of my kids suggested, well, then, Abba, you got to tell the story about how when we crossed the Red Sea, we pulled a fish. And that's, and that's where the sushi <laughs> came from. And I said, that's the beginning of a new tradition. So you'll see in a, in a hundred years, Pacific Rim Seder with wasabi as maror and sushi on the table. Lo, the sushi we ate as we crossed the Red Sea. <laughs> sushi will come in sushi will come in jars with jelly. It'll taste exactly like the filter fish. No, no, that's no. my that's my prediction. Manishevit sushi. sushi. And it'll cost a hundred dollars a bottle. Okay, this, this question has to do with the second part of the Seder. Sure. And um we generally do very little of the second part. I don't, I don't mean to make anybody feel bad, but there were a bunch of people in this room who just asked themselves, wait, there's a second part of the Seder? So yes, after right. dinner, there's a second yeah. part of we the Seder. We generally do very little. We usually sing some of the songs at the end. Everybody's tired. They want to go home. We've spent too much time talking and eating. But <clears throat> there's a very serious part of the second part of the Seder uh, that I'm concerned about how to handle this year, and that is the part about... Uh, uh, those people who are have tried to destroy us over over the years, and I was wondering how you're going to handle that this year. And also, I wanted to know how you're going to handle uh, the coming of Elijah. We we had an interesting way of doing it when I was a little kid, but uh, uh, I don't have t I don't think we have time to talk about that. No, please. How did you do it when you were a little kid? How did okay, you do it little when, when when I was a little kid, yeah. um, my grandfather used to look at Elijah's cup and say. He drank some of it and he used to spill out a little bit of right. it, I think. Right. And it was very mystical. Of course. So uh, we had a an interesting Kiddush cup that had two compartments in it. Mm -hmm. And one year I took my father's electric drill mm -hmm. and I drilled a little hole in the bottom of it. And they and the the wine didn't go on to the uh, table because it was stuck in that compartment. And my mother. Uh, poured the wine in and my grandfather went to look at the cup and it was half empty uh -huh. and he had no idea what happened and no one ever no one ever told him what happened no one, no one. <laughs> there you go there you go so, all right anyhow no i, I think that um, this year uh whether we talk about our enemies in, in the haggadah who've risen up against us whether we, talk, whether we get to the second half and we say we pour out your wrath is i think the way that it's mm -hmm. um, usually translated um, it feels very real. Yes. It feels very real this year. I, I think in many ways, the whole, the whole Passover Haggadah feels real this year in a way that it hasn't, um, that it, right. right. Um, it feels different than, than it has in, in years past. So I, I think that, um, that it, that there's a, that there's a, there's a positive and that, and that there's also a, a drawback to that, right? The positive is that, um, the conversations, and again, I just had them with the with the day school students this morning, the conversations about the Passover narrative and the telling of our story and that people rise up against us and that we're, in fact, not alone. The spirit of the world is is to stand against the the the, the angel of death, as, uh, as Rabbi Feinstein just explained. Um, when it arises, I think that a lot of events come to come to support that, that the kids are aware of. Um, and at the same time, uh, it's awfully sad that we end up in the same place. And sometimes it can be depressing and dejecting if we, if we focus solely on the negative, if you focus solely on those moments in the Seder where we talk about the adversaries, where we talk about these ideas, um, and we don't keep in mind that at the end of the story, at the end of the telling of the Haggadah, we say, and people have been saying that with great faith 
Yeah, I, w- I was thinking of uh, advancing it to somewhere in the first part of the Seder so that we don't end up with a negative at the end of the Seder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So for those who, who don't, I, I was 16 years old before I realized that the Seder didn't end when my father loosened his belt, complimented <laughs> my mother and fell asleep. Um, the second half of the Seder. So it, there is a second half of the Seder. It's not quite as long as the first. And what happens is in the, in the first half of the Seder, we tell the story of the Pesach that was, the Exodus that was. And dinner comes right after we cross the Red Sea. Right after we're free of Egypt, we sing Dayenu, we did the story of the plagues, and then we cross the Red Sea, and that's dinner time. The second half of the Seder is organized to talk about Pesach La'atib, the Pesach that is yet to be, the Exodus that is yet to be, and it's all about the Jewish dream of a redeemed world, of a better world, a messianic world. And that's why in the, in the course of that, you open the door and invite Elijah, Elijah is the prophet that by tradition is going to announce the coming of Messiah. And by inviting Elijah, you're inviting the Messiah, the future, to come into your home and into your life. That's what it's about. And the last lines of the Seder, L'shana Habab Yerushalayim, just before that you, re- you sing that silly song, Chad Gadya, about the guy who bought a goat that got eaten by a cat that got whacked, you know, bit by the dog. And the last line of Chad Gadya, is Viata Kodesh Baruch Hu, God comes, Veshachat Lamalchamavis, and kills death. It's all messianic. That's what the second half of the Seder is. So, first, Gary, I think it's important this year to do that because I think we all need a big dose of hope. And we need to remember that we're not the first generation with tremendous adversity praying for better, hoping for hope, hoping for hope, which I think is important. What I would recommend in the, the, the Hartman Institute, where I, I retreat every summer, uh, to study, put out a Haggadah some years ago, put out by my dear teacher, Noam Sion. Just a brilliant Haggadah. He found a manuscript, and he's that kind of a scholar. He found a medieval manuscript that rewrote that prayer. The prayer in the original is, you're supposed to open a door, and because opening the door around Easter time in Christian neighborhoods in Eastern Europe was a dangerous thing to do. You curse the Goyim, you curse the, the nations, the, the non-Jewish nations. Asher lo yaducha, don't know our God. That's what it says. He found a manuscript which came from Western Europe in a different time, in a different circumstance. And it doesn't say pour out your chama, your, your wrath. It says pour out your love. Pour out your love. Shvach avadcha al ha Goyim asher yaducha. Pour out your love, God, on those who have been our allies, on those who have stood with us, on those who have protected us. And that's it in the Hartman Haggadah. And when Rabbi Shulweis and I created the VBS Haggadah, we used that version. And there's a little reading that we put in there with a list. Rabbi Shulweis, my teacher, was deeply engaged in locating and celebrating Christian rescuers during the Holocaust. So we mentioned the names of Oscar Schindler, Semple Sugihara, Jupe Westerwald, um, these wonderful, Raoul Wallenberg, these wonderful people. And this year too, I think, you know, with all the people that we're so disappointed in, maybe we take a moment and think about King Hussein of Jordan, who just provided enough intelligence and airspace that the Israelis could knock the missiles out of the air, right? And, and, and all of those political leaders around the world and cultural leaders and people that stood up this year. And sometimes standing up this year was really difficult for the Jewish people. But we should talk about them this year. The allies, the friends, the people that stood with us in our adversity. Oh, I think that's a better way to do it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about transition. I've been leading the family Seder for a long time. And I never thought I would say this, especially in public, but even I'm getting tired of hearing me. So the children or grandchildren, um, they have a very limited role. We talk about engaging them, and maybe we can do that in side conversations, but they have a very limited role. So they ask the four questions, and um, and they search for the, uh, the afikoman, sort of, period. And so 
Uh, I wondered uh, how uh, families like ours that are now three generational families, how we can um, pass along not just the attendance and reading parts of the Haggadah, um, but the, the actual responsibility uh, to do a creative contribution. Uh, I don't know if either of you have done that in your in your families. We did it when the children were very young, and and so it's very easy. It's an art project kind of thing. But beyond that, uh, I, I don't know what to do. What, how old are your grandchildren? Uh, the grandchildren are now all young adults. Young adults. <laughs> High school, college, older than college. Older than college. Older than college. Older than college. Yes. <clears throat> well, I, I think it's important to invite invite them. So what we've done over the years to sort of get ready for this, uh, and I'm almost ready for this, um, is to invite them to bring stuff. And so we'll set a theme. So this year we're going to talk about personal liberation. Bring me a piece of poetry. Bring me a song lyric. Bring me an article. Uh, when we were home and able to use media, we even bring up video clips. You know, bring something that reflects this theme and we're going to share it during the Seder. If you want a really simple thing to do, if that's kind of even complicated, do this, because this was at a Seder that I attended when I was a graduate student. We got invited, Nina and I got invited to a Seder. The person said, uh, dress in traveling clothes, because we're leaving Egypt tonight. Bring your passport and bring a suitcase. And then put in the suitcase... If we had to leave home tonight, what's the one thing you'd be sure to take? And then during the Seder, he asked each of us to open a suitcase and explain what was the object and why. You could do that with young adults. Ask them to bring, the, if we had to leave home tonight, if God forbid there was some reason and we had to run, you know, besides a change of clothes and a <clears throat> bottle of water, what would you bring to remember your life, to hold on to your life? Engaging them as creators of the Seder is the beginning of creating a leader. And then see if there's one among them. I happen to know some of your grandchildren. I think there's a couple among them who you can conspire with to say, I'd like you to lead part of the Seder this year. Lead this part of the Seder, lead this part of the Seder. And then slowly allow them to have bigger and bigger parts of the Seder. I think that they would actually take it on. What would be wonderful though, is that they're going to be a lot less tolerant of their siblings, Mishigas, than you were, right? You, you love them all, and if they want to distract and divert and digress, you're okay with it. But ideological young adults, you'll find out, they're going to find out how hard it is to lead a group in a Seder. But I think giving them pieces of it and parts of it, so they take ownership of it, so it becomes theirs. And if they say to you, oh, Grandpa, this is too old, say, good, do it your way. And then you got you to have this incredible ability, they call it in Hebrew Simpson, to pull back and let them do it. And if they screw it up, they screw it. They, want, they can't screw it up. If they, took, if they took ownership of it, that in itself is a gift. So I just want to focus on what Rabbi Feinstein said at the very end, which is what I was going to say is um, <clears throat> the whole Seder is supposed to be a, a process of experiential education, right? Rabbi Gamliel comes along and says, just say these three things and you'll be done. All right. So we keep adding layer upon layer upon layer. So ask them to add their own layer. You know, either do, you know, just like Rabbi Feinstein suggests, they ask them, you know, take this, this paragraph and interpret it your own way, lead it your own way, tell us what you'd like us to do, or ask them what they'd like to bring to the Passover Seder this year. You know, either you have a suggestion like the, it's a it's a terrific idea. What would you what would you take? Or the question could be, um, what would you bring to the seder that's not here on the table? If you wanted to make the seder 2024 appropriate, what's missing from the table? Right? What should Jewish people speak about that we don't speak about at a Passover seder? And I I, I, I bet you that you'll be um, you'll be inspired by a lot of their a lot of their answers. A lot of their answers. Who's your hero of freedom? Ask each kid to, to bring a hero of freedom. Moses is not in the Haggadah. Who else is in, in the Haggadah that ought to be there? Should Ruth Bader Ginsburg be in the Haggadah? Right? Should Martin Luther King be in the Haggadah? So ask the kids, should Harvey Milk be in the Haggadah? Ask each kid to bring one persona and be prepared to present that to the family. This is the person whose, whose story of freedom needs to be included in our own. 
think that would be kind of fun as well. Anything you can do to give them ownership of telling the story in their idiom, in their way. Even even if it's you know the four the question of the four children, how would you explain this? How would you? What do you make of this? Put it on them to explain it, what they make of it. Um, you know, and, and I, I, there is no way. Just to go back to what Rabbi Frank said, there's no way to mess up a seder. It's impossible. As long as you start by saying welcome to the seder and you end by saying b'tei avon, I hope everyone enjoys their meal. As long as the first half begins and ends that way, it was a success. Okay, I I don't mean to to be contrary, but I did, I think, create and preside over the worst Seder ever given in a Jewish household. There was uh, a scientist at UCLA, uh, Emanuel Velkovsky, and he uh, had a scientific explanation for every one of the 10 plagues. And I thought, well, okay, I'm losing the kids doing it the traditional way. I'll do it this way. It was the coldest, worst Seder ever. And I, uh, I retreated from uh, back to tradition. <laughs> we, we always invite guests to the Seder, and uh, um, it's usually people who don't have a place to go or, you know, ex- what we consider extended family. So one year we brought, uh, we invited two. Uh, a couple that was converting, they were, they were, um, uh, they had been pilots with the Blue Angels. One was with the Blue Angels, the other was a, was a, was in charge of uh, marketing coordination for the Blue Angels. So in the middle of the Seder, I, so oh my God, I don't understand, I don't remember what the jumping off point was, but he started to talk about flying the planes for the Blue Angels. Now we grew up watching the Chicago air show um, at the end of every, so that was, that was a major, major deal, was going to the beach and seeing the, the air show. Um, and, and my kids started to say, well, how close do the, the planes fly to each other? And he said, at full speed, the wings are 18 inches apart, one plane to the next. And, there, and he started to go into the details of how to fly a plane. I thought to myself, this is not at all what Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Kiva thought would have been talking about. <laughs> and this is wonderful. This is wonderful. The, people were so engaged in hearing about this. And he talked about it. And then we went on to, you know, Masa. There, were, you know, there was this time at B'nai Brock or whatever it was. But we, I, I really think that even someone who comes along and wants to contribute science to a Seder, it might become a little dry, right? It might become a little dry, but it's nothing that can be solved with an extra cup of wine. Uh, dry is understating it. It, <laughs> it made the matzah look good. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pleasure. I, I want to tell you that the, the Shabbat before Passover is called Shabbat HaGadol. And I always used to think, that it was Gadol because of the spirituality of the final Shabbat before the Passover that's, Exodus story. It's so deep. So deep. So wrong. It, it was so never why it was called Gadol. It was called Gadol because that was the Shabbos where the rabbis would allow anybody from the congregation to ask them questions about kosher for Passover or anything. And the, the questions would go on and on. So the service was Gadol. The service would end up being so long that they named it Shabbat HaGadol, meaning the long Shabbos, not the great Shabbos, not the spiritual Shabbos, the long Shabbos. So, um, so it's nice though to field some questions about Passover and to continue this tradition of, a, of an engagement with the, with the community. I thought Shabbat HaGadol because you get to take a break from cleaning the kitchen and it just feels so good. So, <laughs> so put on some clean clothes, take off the gloves, you know, not smell of cleanser and Lysol. The, the nice Shabbos, that's the, nice, the, the way you It's you a break from, it. the, from the schmutz of, 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 uh, of cleaning out my refrigerator. Break from the schmutz. So I, I hope that everyone who is listening and, um, and, and watching enjoyed this, this break from the schmutz, the break from the, the cleaning and preparation of Passover. Um, and, uh, and I hope you enjoyed being with us in person in the Shilweiss Chapel. Um, happy, happy Passover, Chag Sameach. And we look forward to seeing you here next time at Valley Beth Shalom. A very happy, sweet holiday.